couple of things. If you haven't looked, nobody in my first class had, I don't think. Um, I posted last night, I emailed last night, and I put under the content tab a series of six, six options you can do, including or instead of a formal academic research paper. First one is a formal academic research paper, talk about it a little bit. And then there are five other options. Here's the seven, okay? Um, in your book, pages 940 to 41, assuming we get there, uh, we'll actually read this meditation that's in your book, which is Meditation 17. You've got John Donne's Meditation 17. He wrote these when he thought he was dying, in 1623. Uh, he was 51 at the time. Plague was going through London. Dunn was sick. He literally thought he was on his deathbed. He heard bells tolling. He knows bells toll for only two reasons in England. One, time to go to church. Two, someone died. And when it's a bell tolling for someone dying, just a little side point, when it's a bell tolling for someone having died, sorry, not dying, the bell will toll a certain number of times and then stop, and then it'll toll again another certain number of times. How many times it tolls the first time indicates the sex of the person who's died. If it tolls, I think it is eight times, it's a woman, if it tolls nine times, it's a man. And then there will be a pause. And then it'll toll, I think, I don't remember. It'll toll once for the number of years the person who died lived. So, for example, last year when Queen Elizabeth died, Big Ben tolled, and all the bells in England, churches, tolled eight times, paused, and then I don't know, 90-some years 90 times. I think those were once a minute. So, boom, and then, you know, later. So Dunn hears these bells tolling, and he's thinking, it's for me. And so he writes a meditation upon his impending death, right? You can do the same kind of thing. Here's the real caveat. You, it doesn't have to be a spiritual meditation. You don't have to pretend something you're not if you're not, okay? Doesn't matter. But it needs to be some kind of meditation. That is, you're applying, looking at something you've read in taking it internally. What does it mean? And so you write a series of meditative kind of thoughts on what it means. Okay? You'll see, if you look at Dunn's in the book, or you Google Dunn, the first, second, or third item, if you click Google Done Devotions PDF, and it'll bring you up a series of them. It's like the second or third one gives you the format. And what Dunn does is it begins with a Latin quote, and then a translation, and then the meditation, and at the end of the meditation, this big long, I think that's right, the end of a meditation, a big long prayer, or does the prayer come first? Prayer comes second. The one I'm looking at doesn't include the prayer, just the meditation, okay? So there's a bunch of options. I've already had one person, you know, email me, can I do a series of paintings? And I was like, have at it. Painting or illustrating scenes from something is an option. Continuing or doing a prequel to one of the works we've read. Like, for example, how did the wanderer become the wanderer? That's an option that I actually throw out there. So, a bunch of different options. If you have something else you want to try, um, I actually one time, I've only done this one other time in my 30 years teaching here. It was for an Inklings course. I actually had a, a student years ago do a series of songs, wrote the lyrics, composed the music, and I think recorded them. Some of them were good, others not so much, okay? Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting exercise because it really, it forces you to wrestle more than just a formal academic paper, which 90% of you will take absolutely no pleasure whatsoever in writing. Um, and I want there to be some, okay? So that's another option. So look at that. Um, Sir Gown and Green Knight, page 250. I think we'll get to this today. <clears throat> Sir Gowan's there. 
The two women are introduced. I don't mean that there's only two women in the castle, but the only two women that are emphasized okay, um, at the castle are introduced. And we talked very briefly about this yesterday. Beginning lines 946 and following. So she came through the chancel to greet him courteously, another lady leading her by the left hand, who was older than she and aged one it seemed, respectfully treated by the assembled knights. So you have a young woman being led by the hand by an older woman. And notice we're being told by the left hand. What we're not being told is that the young woman's left hand that is out, and she's being led by the other woman, or is it the old woman's left hand that is back? And the reason I say or, not and, is because usually if you're leading someone, if your left hand is back, how are they holding with what hand are they holding yours? Probably it's going to be the right, because it's difficult to walk like this with the other person right behind. So one, and then the other one off slightly to the side. I think it's important which one's being, has the left hand out. Why? Anybody know the Latin for left? I've referred to it before. Sinister. Like evil, bad. One of my favorite authors, he's a fantasy author, Garth Nix, did a book a couple years ago called The Left-Handed Booksellers of London. It's a great book, by the way. He just came out with The Sinister Booksellers of Bath. It's the same title. He just uses the Latin for left-handed. Okay? So look at the two women. Compare the two women. Very different, line 950. In looks were those two ladies. For where the, young, where the young one was fresh, the other was withered. What's it mean to be withered? Well, we're going to get a description. Every part of that one was rosily aglow. On that other, rough, wrinkled cheeks hung in folds. Not a fold. Not a wrinkle. Wrinkles. She's like a... Some people tell me I shouldn't use this, but so what? A human Sharpe. Anybody know what a Sharpe dog is? Lillian does. She's got a big grin on her face. It's a Chinese dog. It's just one fold. After, you, you can just pull the skin on the dog, and it doesn't stop. Famously known for skin problems. Because if the folds don't get opened up and air gets to them, they get diseases easily. Okay? This is the older one. Many bright pearls adorned the kerchiefs of one whose breast and white throat, uncovered and bare, shone more dazzling than snow new fallen on hills. It doesn't mean she's topless, it's just probably low cut. Okay? There will be a scene later on. It might be topless, we're not quite sure. Uh, the other wore a gorget over her neck, and the very term gorget has at its root gorge which is a name or a word for neck. So she wears something over her neck, her swarthy chin wrapped in chalk white veils. Why would her chin be swarthy? What is swarthy? It's dark. Why does she have a swarthy chin? She's got hairs, okay, on her chin. She doesn't pluck her facial hair. Okay. What else? Her forehead enfolded in silk, muffled up everywhere with embroidered hems and latticework of tiny stitching, so that nothing was exposed of her but her black brows, probably referring to eyebrows, okay? We're going to find out at the end of the poem who this lady is. Very, very famous. Um, what else? Her two eyes, her nose, her naked lips, which were repulsive to see, and shockingly bleared. What are your eyes if they're bleary? Could be. What else? Everybody in here has been bleary-eyed before. Watery. Major allergy or sinus attack or something, you go... So, you know, you're cutting onions, you know, 
dead. So her eyes are, she's got liquid coming out of her eyes. Hmm. A noble lady indeed, you might call her, by God. Now, I don't know, but I'm kind of guessing there's a little hint of sarcasm there. With body squat and thick, short and wide, buttocks bulging broad, more delectable than looks was the lady whom she led. That last couplet, or those last two lines, the poet is distinctly drawing our attention away from the old one to the young one. Gawain glanced at that beauty, the young one, just to make sure nobody's misreading. I did have one student once say, well, doesn't that refer to the old man? Look at the description. Squat, broad, bulging buttocks, who favored him with a look, and taking leave of the Lord, he walked towards him. Favored him with a look, Kind of means she looks at him and nods. That's kind of her approval for him to come speak to her. Okay? So he goes over. He takes the older one. He salutes with a deep bow. Mark of respect. For one reason, if no others, she's his elder. He's showing courtesy. Demonstrating courtly manners. The other one... We're told he takes briefly into his arm, arms, kisses her respectfully, and courteously speaks. I don't know exactly what takes her briefly into his arms means. Because if that were a 21st century reference, probably what would it imply? A hug. A hug? Okay. So arms around? Is it this takes her briefly? It's unclear, okay? They ask to make his acquaintance. He begs to be their servant, if that would please them. They place him between them and lead him to a private room. The Lord comes, etc., etc. okay? Um, talk goes on. We're going to skip a whole bunch. Next evening comes. And line 10, 34 and following. The knight, the lord of the castle, who we still don't know his name. It's going to come up in the last couple pages. Tell Sir Gowan, indeed, sir, as long as I live, I shall be the better because Gawain or Gowan was my guest at God's own feast. From now till the day I die, I'm going to remember today. Why? Because you were here at Christmas time. Don't think of being here at God's own feast at Christmas as like the modern American or the even post Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, post uh, Twas the Night Before Christmas, Christmas thing. There's not a Christmas tree. There's not a bunch of gifts spread. All that comes much, much later. Okay? The Lord tries to beg Sir Gowan to stay. Sir Gowan says, I can't. I've got a date, you know. A date with destiny, so to speak. So he tells the Lord about the Green Chapel, about the Green Knight, about the game. And the knight tells him, bottom of 253, line 1068 and following, now you must stay, for I will direct you at the year's end to the Green Chapel. In fact, you can stay here until New Year's Day. You can sleep in in the morning and still be there by noon. It's two miles away. Okay? Christmas Day. He can stay a week. Cool. So Sir Gowan, we're told, was overjoyed. He doesn't have to die yet. He has another week. Okay? And the knight tells him, let's see here. Line 1089. You have agreed to carry out whatever deed I ask. Let me back up. 1080. Now I thank you heartily for this above everything else. My, my quest is accomplished. I shall at your wish remain here. Do whatever else you think fit. That's Sir Gowan saying to the knight. I don't have to leave. Whatever you command, I'll do it. 
showing fealty, showing the Lord is his Lord, the knight is his Lord, and he is vassal to that Lord. So the knight replies, 1089, you've agreed to carry out whatever deed I ask. Do you mean it? That is, will you keep this promise now, this very instant? Sir Gallant, yes. While I am under your roof, I obey your bidding. Why the while I am under your roof? Why only then? Arthur is his lord. But when he's under the knight's protection in his castle, hospitality kind of stuff, I'm your man, so to speak, okay? The lord says, you're tired. You've been traveling a long time. You're weary. You're hungry still. Tell you what. Tomorrow, sleep in. No alarm. No one will wake you. And when you're ready, you can get up, you can go dine, my wife will come sit with you, she'll talk with you, etc. Until I come home. While you stay here and enjoy yourself, I'll go hunting. Okay? Now let's go one step further. Let's make an agreement, a compact. Whatever I catch in the wood, 1106, I will give to you. Whatever he says, mishap comes your way, give me in exchange. This is the exchange of winnings. What I win in the wood, I'll give to you. What you win here, you give to me. Okay? Whatever mishap. Now, mishap in modern English, if it's used, means bad luck, bad fortune. Miss, bad, happenstance. Here it just means perchance or by chance. Whatever by chance happens that you win something, you give it to me. Okay? Swap, so swear me that truly. By God, I agree to that. And your love of amusement pleases me much. What's meant by amusement? What's an amusement park? Louder. Fun. It's a place where you go and have fun. What's another word or way of describing things you do to have fun? Fun and games. <clears throat> Your love of games pleases me. So the knight says, Somebody bring us a beer. <laughs> we need to drink on this. So they spend the rest of the evening talking and partying and having fun. Part three. Early, before daybreak, the household arose. <clears throat> what does that mean? The servants are up first. Why? They've got to start the fires to start warming the castle. They've got to start cooking the meals for lunch and dinner, etc. The Lord and his knights right out to go hunting with their horses, with their um, dogs and such. What do they go hunting that first day? Deer. Okay. Meanwhile, back at the castle, the good Gawain lies in his fine bed, line 1179, snug while the daylight gleamed on the walls. What is that telling us about the time of day? The sun hasn't just risen over the horizon. It's up high enough that its beams are hitting the walls. That's probably what's meant by gleaming on the walls. It's not just general light. Okay? And as he lazily dozes, he hears a noise at the door. He kind of leans up on one elbow, pulls the curtain back to his four-poster bed, and watches the door. It was the lady, 1187, looking her loveliest. In other words, dressed to kill. <laughs> she's, she's on the prowl. She's just like her hubby. She's on the hunt. 
who shut the door after her carefully, not making a sound. Why? She doesn't want to wake Sir Gowan. She doesn't want to wake anybody else. She doesn't want the door to go click, or like this door does, bam, you know, slamming sound. She comes towards the bed. Sir Gowan's sitting there, lying there, thinking, what the hell's going on? Why is she here? Then he thinks, I should pretend to be asleep. She comes in, lifts the curtain, slips inside, and the curtain over the bed, it's designed in such a way that the curtain isn't right on the edge of the mattress. It's like there's a foot on either side of the mattress. You get out of bed, you can stand up. Here's the curtain right here, the bed's right behind you. She slips in, stands there, pulls the curtain back closed, and then sits down on the edge of the bed. And she waits there strangely long, line 1184, 1194, to see when he would awake. She just sits there, staring at him. A little creepy, <laughs> okay? And he's thinking, what's going on? And he thinks to himself, I should probably wake up to see what's going on. And he opens his eyes, he stretches, excuse me, 1200. He wakes, stretches, turns toward her, opens his eyes, crosses himself, we're told, as if protecting himself by prayer and this sign. Now, protecting himself from her, notice the text doesn't say that. A good, notice the qualification, a good medieval Christian, upon going to bed at night, would say one's prayers, and the last thing before lying in bed would cross oneself. If I die before I wake, the Lord my soul to take kind of a thing. And then the first thing in waking up would cross oneself. Why? Thank you, Jesus, for not taking me during the night, for seeing another day. I'm being facetious in terms of the language, but you get the idea. So he crosses himself because he wakes up again. And she's there. With lovely chin and cheek, a blended color both, charmingly she spoke, from her small laughing mouth. Good morning, Sir Gowan, she says. You are an unwary sleeper that one can steal in here. What does she mean, you're an unwary sleeper? How would we describe that today? What would you, we describe that kind of sleeper? Louder? He's a deep sleeper. Nothing wakes him up, seemingly. Okay. In other words, he's not, the, he's not like me. The slightest noise. I have to make sure the cats are out. Because if the cat is in another part of the house and goes, Meow, I'll wake up. Nobody else will wake up. I'll wake up. He won't wake up, she says. Now you are caught in a moment. Caught. Trapped. Captured. Unless we agree on a truce, I shall imprison you in your bed. Be certain of that. All kinds of innuendo there. Okay, we won't go into it. Laughing merrily, the lady uttered this joke. <laughs> like it's just a joke. Sir Gowan says, good morning. And he notice he says it gaily. He says it happy, happily, blithely, joyfully responding in the description that we had about her, this jest. You shall do with me as you wish, and that pleases me much. For I surrender at runs and beg for your mercy, and that is best in my judgment, for I simply must. In other words, darn, you got me. Okay? He surrenders himself to her mercy. That's part of the courtly love tradition, part of the chivalric tradition. A knight is at his lady's mercy to do with as she pleases. Okay? She jokes in return. Okay, excuse me. He jokes in return and goes on. But if, lovely lady, you would grant me leave and release your captive, ask him to rise, I would get out of this bed and put on proper dress, and then take more pleasure in talking with you. In other words, would you mind stepping outside for just a few moments and let me get dressed so I can properly engage in conversation with you? 
No. No, indeed not, good sir, she says. Why? You shall not leave your bed. I intend something better. Yeah, and we're probably meant to let our minds wander just a little bit. What she intends better in bed. I shall tuck you in here on both sides of the bed. And the way a lot of scholars, I would say most scholars read that, is she bends over and pushes the blankets in on his left side with her right hand and reaches over to his right side and tucks him in on that side. And now she's, if Sir Gowan is here, one hand here, one hand here, head here, her head right here. Okay? And then chat with my knight whom I have you're mine. For I know well in truth that you are Sir Gawain, Sir Gowan, whom everyone reveres wherever you go. Your good name, your courtesy, their honor will be praised by lords and ladies all alike. And now indeed, you are here. So first she praises them. Everybody looks up to you. You're here. And we too are quite alone. Line 1230. What does she mean? She explains, my husband and his men, they're far away. Other servants are in bed, and my women too. The door is shut, locked with a powerful hasp. And since I have under my roof the man everyone loves, I shall spend my time well while it lasts with talk. What does it sound like she's building to before she says, with talk? Husband's gone. Everybody else is asleep. We're way up in a tight, high tower. The door is locked. We're alone. Let's talk. He's probably going, okay. Though he's not. I mean, I'm being facetious there entirely. That's, Sir Gowan's like, cool. Just want to talk. Truly, I am greatly honored. Now, let me back up. Uh, we'll talk. You are welcome to me indeed. Take whatever you want. What does it mean when you say you're welcome? What is that almost always in response to? Thank you. Why does somebody thank you? Because you've done something. Your welcome means don't worry about it. It's okay. All's good. So what does she mean when she says, you are welcome to me? Because what's the other way we use welcome? Come on in. You're welcome to me. I'm yours. Take whatever you want. Notice, take whatever you want. Does that mean I give whatever you want? Circumstances force me to be your servant. What circumstances? What are the circumstances they are in right now? They're in his bedroom, on his bed, door is locked, Lord is away, everybody else is asleep. But she says those circumstances force me to be your servant. Who created those circumstances? Well, she did in terms of being in his bedroom out of bed. Okay. She's his servant. He said earlier, I'm your servant. Gawain. Gawain, sorry. I am greatly honored, though I am not, in fact, such a man as you speak of. And some have read that to mean that Sir Gawain kind of goes, oh, you think... I'm Sir Gowan. No, 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 no. I'm Sir Gowan the less. I'm the Sir Gowan no one's really heard of. I'm, you know, like, um, oh, what's his name? In the Mel Brooks movie, Sherlock Holmes, the smarter younger brother. Um, Warren or something. I can't remember his name. Okay. I'm not that Sir Gowan. He says, to deserve such respect as you have just described, I am completely unworthy. That is, I'm not worthy of you. 
I should be happy indeed if you thought it proper that I might devote myself by words or by deed to giving you pleasure. It would be a joy. Notice what he says there. I should be happy, not I am happy. Difference between am and should be. Should be implies a condition that's not yet in effect in the future. I really would be happy, he says, if you thought it proper, fitting, right, appropriate, that I should give you pleasure. How? Words or by deed. But he doesn't say I am. He's indicating a condition again, hasn't yet been met. Okay? I should be that I might devote myself, etc. And she says, in all truth, if the excellence and gallantry everyone admires, I were too slight or disparage, that would hardly be courteous. Your excellence, your gallantry. What's meant by his excellence? Remember the pentangle? The five fives? That's his excellence. His gallantry, his gallant behavior. The things he's done, supposedly, in the past that everybody has heard stories about. The dragons he's slain, the ogres he's captured, etc., etc. She says, if I were to slight or disparage either of those, that would not be courteous. In other words, I'm going to fulfill the law of courtesy, the proper behavior of court. But a great many ladies would much rather now hold you, sir, in their power as I have you here. To spend time amusingly with your charming talk, delighting themselves and forgetting their cares, than much of the treasure or wealth they possess. There are a whole lot of, probably lightities. Every woman in the world would much rather be with you here right now like I am than have all the wealth that they possess. Okay, so pause for a second. I'm going to assume for a moment that the women in here are all heterosexual. What man fits this depiction? When I've asked that question before, I've had a you know, wide range of you know, responses. Brad Pitt, uh, Thor, um, Hemlock, Chris Hemlock. Not Hemlock. Hemsworth. Hemsworth, thank you. Hemlock's what you drink to die. Uh, Chris Hemsworth, Lee, his little brother, not the third brother. The third brother's fat and pudgy and is like an accountant. He's not an actor, because there is a third Hemsworth. Uh, pick your actor kind of a thing. She's saying, any woman in the world would rather be in my position. Okay? But I praise the same Lord who holds up the heavens. Thank you, God. I have completely in my grasp the man everyone longs for through God's grace. She doesn't mean I have you in my grasp through God's grace. Okay? She means it's through God's grace that you're here. Remember, what did he do before he saw the castle? His pater, his ave, the creed, he crosses himself three times and he looks up and, whoa, there's a castle, just uh, slightly in the distance. Radiant with loveliness, great favor she conferred. The knight with virtuous speech answered every word. I told my first class, I used to know this totally before my pre-Alzheimer set in, it's either a popular etymology or it's the real etymology of the word answer, A-N-S-W-E-R, that it comes from on sword, S-W-O-R-D. It means against sword. So words are being thrown at him and he blocks with his own verbal swords the words that are thrown at him. He says, Lady, may Mary repay you. She's thrown open the curtain by this point. It's implied, kind of. And he probably sees, either sitting on a chair or hanging on the wall, his shield with the outward side of the shield up against the wall and the inward side of the shield where he can see it. 
where there's an icon, an image of Mary. Why does he say, may Mary repay you? Catholic Church, Mary is always what? BVM, Blessed Virgin Mary. He's kind of going, Hail Mary, full of grace, help me now. May Mary repay you, for I have truly made proof of your great generosity, and many other folk win credit for the deed. But the respect shown to me is not at all of my deserving. That is, you've proven yourself, but I don't deserve what you're offering. That honor is due to yourself who know nothing but good. What has he just said about the lady who's sitting on his bed? She is nothing but good. Rephrased, she is entirely good. That's probably why he says, by Mary. He's kind of linking her with Mary. By Mary, says the noble lady, to me it seems very different. Now, I don't know. I never thought of this literally until just now. The idea of the which probably means it's wrong, but I'll throw it out there anyways. To me, it seems very different. Maybe she's saying, you stupid man, I'm not nothing but good. I don't think that's what she means, but that's possible. What does she mean? To me, it seems very different. No, you are worth everything I've just said. You are everything I've said. And the by Mary? I can't help but think of a poker metaphor. I see you're Mary and I raise you a Mary. Because later on he's going to say, by Jesus. I see you're Mary and I raise you a Jesus. If they keep going by this, it's going to end up, I see you're Jesus, I see you're Holy Jesus and raise you Holy Spirit. Okay, now we're getting to the Trinity. There's pretty much nothing else they can buy, buy. If I were the worthiest of all women alive, Worthiest doesn't mean most beautiful, doesn't mean most powerful. It means of most high courtly worth. The greatest queen who ever lived, who also acted queenly, virtuously, moderately, courtly, all that kind of stuff. She says, if I were that woman, and I held all the riches of the earth in my hand. And I could go, okay, line all the men in the world up. Arthur, Lancelot, all the knights of the right table, uh, uh, the round table, all the greatest knights who have ever lived, she says. For the virtues I've seen in you, Sir Knight, here, and I think here means right now in this little interview, Good looks, courtesy, charming manner, and all that I have previously heard and now know to be true. In other words, I've read the news accounts about you. But now I've seen you. I've talked to you. I've heard you. She says, no man on earth would be picked before you. I could have anybody. I could have Arthur. I could have Lancelot. Nope. I'd want you. That's pretty high praise. Okay? He says, Indeed, noble lady, you have chosen much better. Your lord, your husband, not lord, the one higher than you, lord, her husband. Okay? He's much better. But, you know, it makes me feel good, the esteem you you shown me. And in all gravity, your servant, my sovereign, I consider you. That is, in all seriousness, I am your servant. Why? Because I consider you my sovereign. What's sovereign? If you're referring to a female, queen. Male, king. The highest person in the land. And declare myself your knight, and may Christ reward you. That's kind of the, I see you, Mary, and I raise you. So they chat of this and that. Morning comes. 
And the poet tells us, Sir Gowan isn't thinking about love. He's not thinking about romance. Why? Just a few days? He's thinking of death. It, it kind of does, you know, have the ability to focus one's mind a little bit. She bids him goodbye, glances at him, laughs. And then she astonishes him with a rebuke. What does the word astonish mean? Surprise. Literally. Turns to stone. He's like, what? May he who prospers in speech repay you this pleasure, she says. But that you should be Gawain, I very much doubt. You're right. You're not the Sir Gawain I and everybody else have heard of. Why? He's thinking, what in the world have I done? And the poet tells us, fearing he had committed some breach of good manners. Remember what the knights of the castle say among themselves when they find out Sir Gowan is here? Oh, the very source of good breeding and manners is here. Now we can learn just from listening to him. Now Sir Gowan thinks, what have I done? What mannerly code of conduct have I violated? Remember, courtly love and chivalry both say, you cannot do what to a woman? Or you cannot do what and be caught. You can't reject her, you can't deny her, you can't turn her down. Or, if you do, you have to do it in such a way that she doesn't feel rejected, denied, or turned down. Rock, hard place. Damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of a situation. So he says, why? And she says, so good a knight is going as rightly reputed in whom courtesy is so completely, notice, embodied. It's born into him. It's not like he puts courtesy on like he puts on his armor. Could not have easily spent so much time with the lady without begging a kiss to comply with politeness. She's implying politeness. The manners of court suggest that when a woman takes leave of a man, he should request a kiss. Okay? Seems kind of foreign to us today. By some hint or suggestion at the end of a remark. We're not told. I have no idea what kind of hint or suggestion is implied. He says, let it be as you wish. Oh, that's it? Fine, I will kiss at your bidding as befits a knight. That's telling us part of the rules. If she wants a kiss, you give her a kiss. Does he stop there? He could. He could have just stopped right there and gone on to. With that, she approaches him and takes him in her arms. But no, he says, and do more. rather than displease you. So urge it no further. I'll give you a kiss and even more if it won't displease you. So urge no further. Why does he say, so urge it no further? I will do more. I don't want to do more. <laughs> but if you ask me to do more, I will. Now, I didn't think about, I never thought of this until today, my first class. Why might, why might he be saying so urgent no further? Other than breaking some kind of moral law or moral condition. Like reverse psychology? Louder? Like reverse psychology? Okay, possibly. Though they would have no idea of the notion of reverse psychology. What has he agreed to with the knight of the castle? Oh. Might he? Might. I'm not saying he is. I, I honestly, I don't think he is. But it's an interesting, you know, thought game. If he is thinking, I've got to give to the knight whatever I win. So if I kiss her, then I can kiss him. Because that European, you know, 
totally normal for a man to kiss another man upon greeting or leaving, usually three times. Grab him by the head, kiss on this cheek, kiss on that cheek, kiss on this cheek. Okay? But more? Mm, that's a little sketchy. I mean, what does Guinevere accuse? Frank, or, thank you, Long Paul of. I almost said Beowulf. Totally different stuff. Okay? Of being gay. With that, she approaches him, takes him in her arms, stoops graciously over him, and kisses the knight. They commend each other to Christ's keeping. God be with you. Christ be with you, you know. She gets up, goes about her business. He gets up, goes about his business. We get a big, long description of the knight of the castle killing the deer, gutting the deer, skinning the deer, okay, and bringing it back. And he says, I've got this medicine for you. What do you think? Sir Gowan says, it's great. It's all yours. This is my keeping my end of the bargain. Top of 262. Sir Gowan says, you're right. What I have honorably, line 1386, one inside this castle with as much goodwill truly shall be yours. He takes the other strong neck in his arms and, okay, says, here, take my winnings. The knight, that's a good winning. Would you mind telling me where you got it? He says, not part of the agreement. <laughs> you didn't ask. You know, don't ask, don't tell, kind of a... Okay. They laugh and joke. The knight says, double or nothing, let's do it again. I'll get up early. I'll go out hunting. You just lounge around here and have fun. Well, not too much, but anyways. So the knight goes out. Next day, he hunts boar. What's the difference between hunting deer and hunting boar? Harder. Harder. It's more active. It's more active. Is Bambi going to kill you? A stag could. What's more likely to kill you, a stag or a boar? A boar. Why? A stag has antlers. A boar has tusks. I told the, my first class. About four or five years ago, I think it was, kid and I think a 16-year-old kid, Georgia or Alabama, was hunting feral wild boar. Sucker killed a boar that was six foot tall at the shoulder. So when the boar raised its head, the head was up like about seven. I'm 5'10. Big porky, right? It was like 1,500, 2,000 pounds. Boars are huge. Boars easily, or boar, can easily kill a man. We got accounts from the Middle Ages, people doing boar hunts and a guy getting gutted. Like, you know, running the, bull, the bulls in Pamplona, Spain. Okay? So they go off and hunt boar. We're told. Meanwhile, line 1469. Our gracious knight lies in his bed. Gawain, happily at home amid bright colored bedding, nor did the lady fail to wish her guest good day. Early she was there, his mood to mollify. What does it mean to mollify? To please, to make happy, to make enjoyable. You Usually that verb is used in relation to someone's anger. To calm them down. Why would his mood need mollifying? He's one day closer <laughs> to getting his head lopped off. She comes to the curtain, peeps in at the night. Sir Gowan welcomes her. Notice he doesn't pretend to be asleep. She returns his greeting with eager, eager speech. And she goes, if you are Sir Gowan, it astonishes me that a man always so strongly inclined to good cannot grasp the rules of polite behavior courtly behavior. She just said, Gowan, you're violating the rule of courtly behavior. Now what? He says, what? What did I do? What was that? She says by the, you know, like 1486. 
1485, you've quickly forgotten what I taught you yesterday by the very truest lesson I could put into words. What was the lesson she put into words? You should have asked me for a kiss. He doesn't remember it. I told you about kissing. To act quickly. This is, this is where in the 21st century in the classroom teaching this, this can get dangerous, okay? Because of some of the stuff that's alluded to. I told you about kissing. To act quickly wherever a glance of favor is seen. Okay, anyone. Define or describe a glance of favor. Well, earlier, a glance of favor was she kind of looks at him and does something so that he gets up from his seat and goes and sits by him. I think that's merely, she might look at him or she might look at him and gently nod her head. That could be a glance of favor. What is she saying? I give you a glance of favor. I look at you. I bat my eyelashes. And her implication is, what does that mean? Kiss me. Men, don't try that today. <laughs> You'll get skewered. But not here, apparently. Because she doesn't stop there. She says, lost my place. Whenever a glance of favor is seen, that befits every knight who practices courtesy. That is, it befits, it is fitting, it is meet, it is right. If a woman shows you her favor, that means gives her approval, it's okay. Sir Gowan, enough of such talk. In other words, stop talking, start kissing. For I dare, mm, that's not what he means. Enough of such talk. For I dare not do that, lest I were refused. So what if I interpret your glance of favor wrongly? And you go, ew, no, I don't want to kiss you. Ma foi. By my faith. You know, cue the Scarlet O'Hara, as God is my witness. What? You. Could not be refused. What does she mean? In fact, she even kind of says, if any woman were so ill-mannered as to refuse you, you could not be refused. This is the ideal of male everything. <laughs> Beauty, desirability, so that any woman, probably straight or not, looking at him would go, yeah, I'd do him in a heartbeat. Notice what she says. You cannot be refused. You are strong. You are strong enough to force your will if you wish. <laughs> Lillian's face just said everything. Ew, wrong on every level. Okay? Force your will. You could rape if you pleased. Because he's strong, right? I mean, he's a knight. Force, that's what force your will means, if, if it's not clear. If, notice she says, any woman were so ill-mannered as to reject you. Why is this dangerous language today? I don't know if it was dangerous back then. I think it was. I think it was just as dangerous in... Get the right date. 14th century England as it is today. Why? Because we're going to see it discussed in the Wife of Bath's Tale in the Canterbury Tales. If some woman refused you, you should rape her, is almost what she's saying. Why? Because she would be showing ill manners. Not ill manners, any, any man who wanted to sleep with her, she should let him. Sir Gowan, he's the epitome, he's the, ide whatever one's ideal is, that's him. Okay? <clears throat> Look at his response. What you say is quite true. 
you're right. I could force my will. I am strong enough. But he doesn't stop there. But in my country, force is considered ignoble. Force is not courteous. Rape is not noble. Rape is not virtuous. What does he mean in my country? Y'all got some strange manners here. If rape is allowed. If rape is okay. Merely because I'm stronger than you are. In my country, that is, in the civilized world, we don't do that. In Arthur's court, which is the seat of chivalry, we don't do that. The Pentecost oath forbids that. Any knight who violates a woman is not a knight. Period. Out. Loses the seat at the table. The whole nine yards. We're going to see when we get to the wife of Beth's tale. The wife of Beth, after her big long prologue, about all of her marriages to all of her husbands, who are all anti-feminists, essentially, because she's a proto-feminist, or at least that's the way a lot of people read her. She then tells a tale about an Arthurian knight, someone from Camelot, who rides out into the woods, and he sees a beautiful young maiden. He goes, yeah, I'll do her, and he rapes her, right there in the woods. Okay? She runs to Camelot, tells Arthur what happened. Arthur goes, I'm not judging him. Guinevere, your decision. And Guinevere says, I'm not going to judge him right now. You're going to see when we get to this two weeks. Maybe end of next week. She's going to say, ladies, what do we do? And she gets all of her ladies together, and they come up with a solution. He has to find out the answer to a question. And they're going to give him a year and a day. Anybody know what the question is? Mel Gibson and Helen Hunt did a movie with this as its title. What Women Want. What do women want? Okay? And the guy has to go off and find out. And guess what he does? What do women want? Answer one. What do women want? Answer two, three, four, five. None of them were the same. The guy's like, I'm screwed. <laughs> I'll ride back to Camelot and... <laughs> Okay? I won't give the rest of the story. We'll wait till we get there. So, in my country, we don't do things that way, he says. Force is considered ignoble, and so is each gift that is not freely given. If it's not freely given, is it a gift? No, it's not, obviously. I am at your disposal. Okay, She says, you are welcome to me. And you know what? You could force me if you wanted to. He says, I am at your disposal. To kiss when it pleases you. You may take one when you like and stop as seems good in a while. So what does he do? Does he do like Will Smith's character, like Hitch tells Kevin James' character in the movie Hitch, go to 90% and then just wait. <laughs> Let her come the last 10 or does he just sit there and say, no, 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 you got to come to 100. Because <laughs> if I even move a degree closer to you, that could be an imbalance. I think he waits. He says, I'm here. I'm ready. She bends down over him and gives the knight a kiss. Notice the narration doesn't say he moves at all. It's entirely on her part. Okay? And then they discuss love's misery and bliss. What? Why not love's bliss? And leave the misery out. The great tales of romantic love all involve what? Romeo and Juliet. They all involve death. I had written up here the other day. Right up here. Liebestod. L-I-E-B-E-S-T-O-D. It's German. Love, death. And it's because there's this idea that in great romantic love stories, 
they all end in death. A guy, I, I didn't write it up today. I'll write it up next day. A guy named Denis de Rougemont, I'll, I'll write it on the board, wrote a book called Love in the Western World, where he looks at romantic stories. Every last damn one of them. One of the two people dies, if not both. Romeo and Juliet, Lancelot and Guinevere, Tristan and Yvain, Dido and Aeneas. Dido kills herself. Antony and Cleopatra. You could just go on down the list. They do not end like Jerry Maguire. You complete me. You know, that they end in death. So they talk about this stuff. We're not told what tales, but we are, we, I mean, we do have many medieval tales of this. One of the greatest ones is in Dante's Divine Comedy. And it's a true story. It actually happened. Of two lovers named Paolo and Francesca. Francesca was married to Paolo's brother. And Paolo and Francesca find themselves one day, the brother's away, and they're reading stories of love's in Dante, it's almost the exact same words. Love's misery and bliss. And they look up from the book at each other, and the next thing you know, they're rolling around on the ground. And the brother comes in and catches them in flagrante delicto, that is, in the act, and he runs a sword through them. And they end up in hell forever chasing each other, but never catching each other. So she says... I would learn from you, sir, if the question was not irksome. That is, I don't really want to ask the question. I just kind of want you to show me. But she's going to ask him because he's not showing her. How knights have ventured their lives for true love. If you are truly a knight of the round table, then you have done what? What do the knights of the round table do? Pick up Mallory's works. They go off and they do all this stuff for love. Okay. What's her point? If you're an Arthurian knight, if you're a chivalrous knight, well, you can teach me about love. Not just teach me by word. She'll go on and say, fifteen twenty-five and following. You who make such courteous and elegant vows. What kind of vows has he made? You are my sovereign. I'm your servant. Do with me as you wish should be eager to instruct a youthful creature. What's she saying about herself? Was she? I don't know nothing about love. I'm just innocent. I'm like a pure white lily out here. I need to be taught. Look at Sir Gallon's response when we get to it. She says, to teach a youthful creature and teach her some elements of skill in true love. What does skill mean? And your face is scrunched up. Practice. If you're an education major, you get all this, my opinion, useless theory in the classroom. And then what do you have to do before you can become a teacher? You have your practicum. You get thrown into the wolves for a semester where all that theory be shown to you to be worth not a lick because you have to deal with the students. You have to manage the classroom, so to speak. She's saying, I know the theory of love. I know how to drive a car. I can read about how to drive a stick shift. Doing it? Yeah, a little bit different. So she says, here I am. Are you ignorant who enjoys such great faith? That is, do you not really know? Or do you think me too silly to take in courtly chat? Am I too foolish or uneducated? You know, because in his country, they do things differently than they do here. For shame, I come here alone and sit to learn your special, not words, not discourse, not conversation, play. Show me your expertise while my husband is away. He's gone. We're here. Let's get to it. 
in good faith, may God reward you, and God help me now. <laughs> it gives me great gladness and pleases me hugely that one as noble as yourself should make your way here and trouble yourself with the nobody. I am nobody. What? It gives me delight. 1540 to 43. No, 44 or so. But to take the task on myself of explaining true love and to treat the matter of romance and chivalric tales to you, whom I know well. Why do we get that I know well? How does he know it well? She's married. She's married. Okay. I think he's saying, by all of the interaction we've had over the last two days, that's how he knows this well. But to teach you, to treat the matter of romance and chivalric tales, to you whom have more experience in that subject, what's experience imply? Physical abilities. She knows what it's like to have more expertise, sorry, not experience, expertise, who have more expertise in that subject by half than a hundred such men as myself ever can. You know more, you have more expertise in romance and chivalric tales than 150 men like me. What's he just said about her without overtly saying it about her? I saw two smirks. Those smirks must mean something. Well. Yeah, pretty much. Or he's saying, in matters of romance and chivalric tales, I'm like a toddler. I'm just learning how to walk. Honey? You've been around the block a hundred times. Well, I'm still learning that, you know, my steps. I can't teach you anything about love. Again, look at all of her conversation. From then, from the beginning to now. Does she know what she's doing? Or is she totally naive? And doesn't have a clue about the double entendre in anything that she says. Okay, just hold that idea. He says, however long I may live, I can live to be 100 years old, and I still wouldn't be able to teach you. It would be absolute folly, noble lady, on my word, for me to try to teach you anything. Could he stop there? He could. I will carry out your desires with all my power. What's with all my power? The whole thing, my wit, my mind, my heart, my soul, my body, with all of my abilities, he says, I will carry out your desires, whatever it is you wish, as I am in all duty bound. How is he bound by duty? You are my sovereign. I am your servant. You issue a command, I have to fulfill it and always will be the servant of your wishes. May God preserve me. That's his way of saying, help me, God. Why? He's just offered himself. But who is his Lord? The Lord of the castle. Who is, oh wait, who's his other Lord? Arthur, not Arthur. Yes, Arthur. I almost said Alfred. Thus that lady made trial of him, tempting him many times to have led him into mischief, whatever her purpose. She had an awful lot of criticism of this poem. It, it, just about every student I've had who's written about this poem has written about the portrayal of the lady as, you know, this old trope of woman as temptress and all that kind of stuff. Notice what the poet includes in that last half line I just read. Whatever her purpose. It begins. She made trial of him. 
tempting him, to have led him into mischief. All three of those imply what? If we say someone is tempting somebody else, what does that suggest about the person doing the tempting? Louder. There's a motive for it, right? You want to get the person to do what? To give in to the temptation. You want them to fall. Here, whatever her purpose. The poet is suggesting, I don't know what her purpose is. The poet is suggesting that her actions might not be prompted by an evil there might be some other intention involved. But look at the verbs that are used, or nouns. Made trial, tempting, mischief. The mischief and the tempting are, but what other phrase could we use to made trial of him? Tempted him, proved him, tested him. In fact, the knight is going to say, this very night, I've tested you twice. Trial, test, prove. They're all words that come from a medieval science. Anybody knows what science is? Alchemy. Alchemy was all about two things. Finding out what the true nature or essence of something is. I mean, there's about a variety of things, but these are two parts of it. Finding about the ultimate nature or reality of a thing and its transformation. It's being turned from one thing into something else. The old, you know, portrayal of it is, you know, Harry Potter, philosopher's stone that can turn base metal into gold, that can provide a true aqua vitae, water of life. By the way, aqua vitae, that's where the word whiskey comes from. For those of you who like whiskey, you know, the more you drink, the more life you have. Living water. Go back to John's gospel in Jesus' meeting with the Samaritan woman. If you knew who it was who was talking to you, I would give you a draft of living water. And she goes, you don't even have a cup, etc. Okay? He's tested. He's proven. He's tried. What the purpose is, we don't know yet. Okay? So, she kisses him. Notice, then she kissed her guest. Again, she kissed him the first day. He didn't reach out and kiss her. She gets up, leaves. He gets up, goes to church. Day goes by. Night comes back. Boar lays it all out for Sir Gowan. Long description the slaughtering, the killing, the, you know, disemboweling, all that kind of stuff. And Sir Gowan says, you're right, and I owe you something. He gives him a kiss. 1644, the Lord says, by St. Giles, another patron saint of hospitality, by the way, you're the best man I know. You'll be rich soon. <laughs> Keep going like this. What else are you going to win? Okay? So he tells him. Sir Gowan says, I gotta leave the next day. I gotta go off to my no 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 no, you can stay, right? He already told him you can stay till New Year's. You can leave that morning, you'll be there. No time, no problem. Page 269. The knight tells him. Lie in your bed, like 1676, enjoying your ease on New Year's, and I shall hunt in the woods. Or tomorrow morning, I'll lead you to the Green Chapel on New Year's. Tomorrow morning, lie in your bed at ease. I'll go hunt again. Best throw third time. 1679. I have tested you twice and find you trustworthy. Let us make merry uh, tomorrow. Remember, best throw third time. What's best throw third time mean? Third time's a charm. Third time what? Third time really proves who you are. Notice, I've tested you twice, he says. What does Sir Gowan think they're involved in? I 
like your amusement. This is a game. Being tested is not a game. I mean, you can test yourself through various things. I used to run marathons when I had knees at work. I, I love nothing more than to go out on a long run, you know, as part of the preparation. Long run, 20 miles or more. Okay? You prove yourself. I always wanted to do an ultra marathon. That is a distance longer than 26.2 miles, like a 50 miler, a 100 miler. There are things that do this, right? Places that have these. Sir Gallen can test himself, but that's a self test. The knight is testing him. It's like, what's he testing me for? So, next morning, the knight and his men go off and hunt. They hunt for a fox. Of these three animals, which is the most dangerous? The boar, clearly. Which of them is probably hardest to hunt? The boar is big. It's going to make a hell of a lot of noise tramping around through the forest. The deer is pretty stealthy, but they're also big in terms of sight. A fox? It's like an overgrown cat, man. They're sneaky. What verb is used to describe a fox or noun, depending on how it's used? Sly or cunning? Cunning. They're clever. They're smart. So he catches a fox. Meanwhile, Sir Gallen is asleep until she shows up. She dresses to the nines. 1735 and following, a mantle reaching to the ground, richly lined with well-trimmed furs. She doesn't have a head covering on. Her lovely face and throat displayed uncovered, breast exposed, shoulders bare, probably just means low covered, showing cleavage. She enters the chamber, shuts the door, opens the window and says, get up, because Sir Gowan's asleep this day. In fact, we're told he's asleep and thinking of what? Tomorrow's New Year's. Tomorrow he has to meet the Green Knight. He wakes up. He sees her. She approaches him. She bends over, kisses him, welcomes her politely. 1760. Seeing her so radiant and attractively dressed, every part of her so perfect and in color so fine, his hot, passionate feeling welled up in his heart and probably other parts of his body, too. He looks at her and is like, mm -mm, mm -mm. Notice, he's not thinking of death. Smiling gently and courteously, they make playful speech. She, hold on, did I forget? No, I didn't. They talk, and we're told they spend time in happiness and joy and delight. 1768, uh, seven. Pleasure reached its height. Great peril threatened. Should Mary not mind her night? Notice the poet doesn't say, should the night not mind Mary, not remember Mary. Great peril if Mary doesn't what? Why do Catholics pray to Mary for intervention? If Mary doesn't intervene, he's toast. For that, and we're told because of what comes after. That's what the four means. For that noble lady so constantly pressed, pushed him so close to the verge. That's the edge that either he must take her love there and then or churlishly reject it. Take her love there and then, have sex with her, or like a churl, C-H-U-R-L comes from the Old English C-E-O-R-L. What's a churl? The lowest person in society. The manners, the behavior of a peasant, essentially. He's either got to say yes, 
or he has to violate both the law of chivalry and law of court and love and reject her so that she knows she is being rejected. Kind of like what Lawnfall does to Guinevere. He's concerned for good manners, that is, for courtesy. But he's even more concerned that he doesn't sin. And he thinks, God forbid, that is, that he sin. And I think sin is meant in more than one sin. Not just a moral sin, sleeping with another man's life. That's definitely part of it. But the other part of the sin is to violate this entire moral code. So with affectionate laughter, he puts to one side all the loving inducements that fell from her. She says something, and he just chuckles as a way of kind of trying to diffuse it. And she says, you deserve rebuke if you feel no love for the person you are lying beside. Now, that's been variously interpreted. Does that mean she's no longer sitting by him? Is she now lying in the bed beside him? A little more dangerous situation. More than anyone on earth wounded in her heart, unless you have a mistress. You should be ashamed, she says. For what? If you feel no love for the person you are lying beside. What does she mean, feel? Does she mean feel, physical, okay, responses, or in here? I think it's probably both. I think she's probably saying, by the look of you, you don't feel anything for me. That is, his body has not reacted to her. And here's your out, Sir Gowan. Unless you have a mistress, someone you prefer, and you've plied a trough. You don't feel anything for me, physically or emotionally, because you're engaged. Now, that's the biggest out in the world she just gave him. All he has to do is say what? Yeah, you're right. I do have a love. She's back at Camelot. And that's why I can't give you what you want. Drive a Mack truck to that sucker. It is so big. And he says, no. In truth, I have no one. Not even on the horizon. Nor seek one for this while. Nor am I looking for one. If he had stopped after the first part, it'd be bad. But nor seek one, ew. Go away. Now what's his reason for not seeking one? Because he's going to die. Yeah. Would that be quote unquote fair? <laughs> To her, imagine you're in a and no, take that back. Imagine you meet someone, and it is the typical Western romance. This was me entirely. Okay, before I even talked to my wife, my future wife, I saw her, and it was like Cupid wasn't sitting there like Stevie Wonder, you know, shooting arrows out of the air. It was like Cupid was aiming right at me. I saw her and I thought, I'm going to marry her. Lo and behold, a year and a half later, dead. A year and a half, two years, something like that. I could tell you about the Cold War and everything we went through first. He's saying it's like if they met each other and fell wildly in love without even speaking to each other, but he knows he has to die tomorrow, would it be right to do slash say anything? That'd be pretty cruel. Okay? 1103. That remark is the worst thing you're going to say. But I'm answered indeed and painfully, I feel. Why? Okay, so you don't have a lover. I could have accepted that. And you're not even looking for one? Hello? Just as I said, Sir Gowan is like male ideal. She, female ideal. I mean, everything. Brains, looks, attitude, the Character, she says, well, since I'm going to pine for you for the rest of my life, at least give me something so I can look at and think of you. I had Sir Gowan in my arms, and he slipped through my fingers, you know. 
And he's like, I don't have anything. If I did have anything, it wouldn't be worth giving to you. Why? She's worth more than anything he could give. And she's kind of like, okay, that was a pretty slick answer. That's, you know, you chalk one up there. So I'm going to give you something. What does she offer him? One of these. And he's like, no, I don't want it. She's like, what? If you reject my ring because you think it too precious, wish not to be so deeply indebted to me, I'll give you something else. By the way, both the ring and the girdle are, notice I'm doing this, <laughs> circles which have a something solid and empty in the middle. All kinds of Freudian stuff, all right? We're going to stop there and pick up with, uh, I'll say 1827 on whatever it is, Tuesday. We'll finish, we'll definitely finish this. We'll finish it probably before the end of class. So also for Tuesday, read Chaucer's prologue to the Canterbury Tales. It's about 700 or so lines, 790 lines. Um, don't forget quiz, no, not quiz, exam due tomorrow night, I think it is. Wait, or is that quiz? Quiz, sorry. Got all my classes mixed up. <laughs> If you want to come up with a different option than those that I've posted, or this one, send me an email instead of the paper, formal academic research paper. And I'll more than likely say, go for it.